Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our um, dialogue about culturally relevant education. And I know, Marcos, that you have to, um, you have other things to tend to right after this. So, Marcos, would you like to go first? I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. That way, if you have to go afterwards, no, no worries. You can do that. Let me give you a proper introduction here. Let's see. Marcos Aguilar is co-founder and currently serves as executive director of Semilla Sociedad Civil. In 2001, he served as a charter school developer for Escuelas Autónomas Dignidad, a community-based group of parents and educators where he was responsible for designing the curriculum, organizing strategist plans, community mobilization, budget management, and governmental relations. He also served as a bilingual single subject sec secondary teacher in the LA Unified School District from 1994 to 2001. Mr. Aguilar received a bachelor's degree in Chicana and Chicano Studies from UCLA in 1994. Additionally, he holds both a single subject teaching credential in social science and a master's in education administration from the California State University, Los Angeles. Gracias, hermano. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I don't know if you want to say your timer, or if you just want me to give you a heads up at 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I guess I'll set a 10 minute timer and then I already know I'm going to violate my own rules. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is it okay if I have your web page up in the meanwhile? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. You. All right. Go ahead. Take it away. Um, oh, it's like Johnny Canales, huh? <laughs> Take it away. You got it. Take it away. Pues muchas gracias. Nimis la soca machilia. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, I'm I'm inspired uh, every time I'm invited to speak, which is not a whole lot of times. Don't you know? It's not like I'm a public speaker or anything. Uh, but but I am inspired to be invited to speak in Chicano and Chicano Studies classes. Uh, since so much of my life uh, was at one point dedicated to making sure that these classes existed. Uh, something I didn't speak of earlier is that as a student organizer at UCLA, uh, we were part of a collective that, that helped to defend Chicana and Chicano studies at a time when uh, some, some, even in our own community, wanted to see it disappear. Uh, when national politics were driving people to identify as Hispanics, uh, emphasizing the, the so-called uh, alleged uh, Spanish ancestry of, of uh, Mexican people, not really recognizing indigenous peoples, and not really recognizing Central Americans either, because at the time, the the latest uh, wave of migration as a result of the United States' imperialism in Central America uh, was still, you know, very much a sensitive political reality. And, um, and so in the 90s, uh, we were part of a very focused group of young people as undergraduates uh, to to defend Chicana and Chicano studies at UCLA. And when I say defend, um, you know, I mean it in, in, in both the literal and, and philosophical sense uh, in that the university administration at UCLA had set out to end the programs um, that were started by people like one of my mentors, Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones and Dr. Rudy Acuna and and so many other um, women and, and, and youth and uh, scholars and militants, uh, people who died along the way um, that imagined uh, a, a different relationship to education um, that they drafted in the Plan de Santa Barbara and the Plan de Aslan and, and so many different iterations and visions of the expression of the Chicano movement from the blowouts through the movements, the mass movements for immigration reform in the 80s. And, um, and by the 90s, uh, you know, there were a lot of forces at play, both internal divisions that, that allowed for the university institutions and others to attack them. But also we know now very real military political forces uh, designed to imprison people 
uh, conducting uh, secret FBI investigations, uh, making division uh, between people. We know now that uh, somebody like, for example, Corky Gonzalez's leadership in, in Colorado was targeted by the FBI so much to the point that his, not only did the FBI cause in a way his divorce, but after the divorce, uh, his ex-wife remained active in the crusade for justice in that movement and uh, married somebody who eventually was discovered to have been an FBI informant. Um, and, and that's the level of, of uh, you know, commitment to destroying uh, institutions like Chicana and Chicano studies that, that this government carried out. Um, our organizing at UCLA culminated in some ways with a hunger strike that we led for two weeks and it kind of stopped the city at the time and forced, uh, you know, in, in some ways, the university to its knees. And, and it, it committed us in many ways to decide, you know, what side of the fence are we on? Are we only talking about uh, community organizing and, and the beauty that we believe in and our people? Or are we really ready to lay our lives down? And, and we saw it that starkly in black and white. Cesar Chavez had just died himself on a fast. Um, and uh, the day that he died, the chancellor of UCLA decided to announce that there would never be a Chicano studies department at UCLA over his dead body. And, and that really, uh, you know, insulted us and infuriated us and, and we had our, had, had uh, engaged in years of organizing and struggle. When I look now at what Chicano and Chicano Studies has become, whether at UCLA or elsewhere, it's a little disappointing to think that all of that commitment to putting our life on the line ended up in hiring people to become professors who we may wonder out loud if they would ever put their life on the line for what we defended. Uh, if they, as uh, scholars and, and professors and, and uh, um, I guess, intellectuals uh, that are now working in these posts that we opened up for them at the universities would do that. Uh, on my timer, I have three and a half minutes left to tell you about our vision of cultural relevance. Um, and so to summarize, we think that culture is at the core and expression of our humanity. And that if what matters to us does not matter in the school, that then our children in those schools are being violated by the institutions we're sending them to. We think that our dreams, our hopes, our histories, our languages, our understanding of the world our imagination of our future is important and that nobody else should tell us what it should be that we have an innate human right to express it and to organize it and to live it freely it's uh, contradictory to think that in the very government that invaded this land, we would find our liberation. But yet, we'll continue to dream about liberation through education across the generations. We'll continue to hope that by handing a book to a child, by putting your arm around a child in a time of, in a time of uh, the need for comfort, by uplifting the spirit of a child who just lost their brother to a drive-by or to COVID for all we know, uh, that, that that will water the human spirit, that will breed dignity, that will inspire in that next generation a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. When we talk about cultural relevance in education, we're, we're not just talking about how to get kids into college, how to 
help them find a way towards a career, how to make sure that, 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 that they are not just another statistic shot by a cop somewhere in a dark alley. In our greatest moments, we're imagining our liberation as human people, as human communities, as uh, roots of this continent. In our greatest aspirations, we're thinking beyond the walls of the school, beyond the limits of the language of the Declaration of Independence of the United States, because we know that our own independence, that our own self-determination is born of something deeper and older and more powerful rooted in this continent. When we think about our children in schools alone, without us, without their parents, without those advocates, those movement leaders, we need to think about who it is that's teaching in those schools, what it is they're teaching, and why we don't control the very thing that is creating their sense and sensibilities and sometimes their self-hate. When we look across the state of California, we ask ourselves, who is it that's teaching in schools? The very simple answer is mostly white people. And we know that even those that aren't white may mostly be thinking white. And we have to wonder how long it will take for us to grapple with that, to create our own institutions. This is why we, in our communities here in East Los Angeles, the few of us that struggled really for a decade to imagine what a, what a school would be like, why is it that from the Chicano movement, there are no leftover institutions we can look at that are controlled and self-determined by our communities? Where did that go? When we started in the early 2000s, we, we found the Escuelita de la Raza Unida in Blythe, Arizona. We, we visited and heard about the Tlatelolco School in Colorado. There was in Phoenix, you know, uh, Cali Calmeca uh, was, was one example, but really not many at all. And those schools have since closed. Um, and so we know that, that this idea about self-determination in education, at least as we express it in Anahuacalmeca in our school in East LA, comes from a trajectory of struggle, aspires to contribute to a trajectory of hope and is rooted in a sense of understanding of self, of people, of our indigeneity that goes beyond 500 years and that encompasses our entire continent as indigenous peoples. Um, cultural relevance is about what matters. And if we send our kids to schools where who they are does not matter, then no matter what they say they're teaching, their sense of spirit and their sense of self and, and therefore our community's sense of spirit and self will be violated. And this is why we fought to have classes like this for you here today. So that you may feel loved, important, that you matter and that you feel a sense of calling to also want to give back and serve our community and our peoples. Thank you. Gracias, Tlaxoco Mati. Um, I, I personally, I just want to thank you for the many years of struggle and sacrifice that you've committed to our communities, you know, from fighting for Chicana Chicano studies in your days at UCLA and helping with the hunger strike and building this school, creating the school, literally. Um, you know, and there's so much work to be done and there's so much reflection of what's worked, what hasn't worked, what, and what areas do we need to continue growing? How do we or continue to organize or look at organizing differently? There's all that that we always have to consider, but the amount of work and what has been done is to 
be commended. Like that this is this is a long lifelong journey and sacrifice that I and many others have seen from your part. So I would just like to personally thank you for that because without that, I wouldn't I wouldn't have the degrees that I have in Chicana and Chicano studies. Like I wouldn't have been able to take those classes. I wouldn't be teaching Chicana and Chicano studies right now. My students wouldn't be able to enroll in these classes. So I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for all that work. And you know, I've had the pleasure and the honor of visiting Semillas a couple of times and um, you know, just being able to see students and everything that is in there directly, not even kind of sort of over here, maybe over there, but it totally and directly immersed in their indigenous cultura is just uh, amazing. I just, I, I love it. And we still have work to do and there's a lot to figure out, but hey, there's a school that exists, you know? Um, and so thank you for that. But students, I wanna open it up to you all. Um, you have about five minutes for Q&A with Marco. So comments, questions, please unmute. Let's hear your voices. What was, what, what was the reason that UCLA wanted to take away those programs? Uh, well, I think it was white supremacy. I think it was, um, you know, that style of racism that that uh, hates uh, the fact that an, an institution that thinks of itself as a prestigious world, world class institution uh, would have to include um, people like us that that um, would want to teach about what matters to us as something important and worthy of study. Uh, you know, it, it hasn't always been accepted that that the history of workers is important, that the history of women is important, that the history of, of other people is important. And we had to wage that battle to, uh, whether they liked it or not, and whether they felt it was important or not, uh, to keep it, um, to find its place there. But I think they also wanted to, to close it, um, uh, to end those programs because they wanted to get rid of the people that had been there since the Chicano movement who opened those spaces. And I think they saw an opportunity to get rid of them. And, and we as students, uh, you know, didn't want that. Thank you. That's so interesting. Thank you. Also remember that um, everything that we do have it was never just handed to us. It's always come from struggle. And, and, and then when we do have it, the struggle continues to maintain it, to keep it. Because if we don't, um, it'll become watered down or chipped away until it just isn't there anymore again, right? So just the struggle is always going to continue. You know, como se dice, la lucha sigue. It's, it's, you think that you win and we're done, but it's, we're never done. And so, um, and, and I don't want to make it seem like it's daunting and unattainable. It's just the reality of what it is, you know, because we still lived, live in a very colonized and oppressive society. So the struggle is gonna continue uh, as long as we live in an oppressive, racist, uh, co colonialist society. Um, and until we dismantle all of that, which may take generations, it, it, it will always be a struggle. And then the struggle continues to maintain it. Right. So, um, but instead of looking at, oh my goodness, just embrace it, embrace the beautiful struggle because it is beautiful. Okay. Um, other questions or comments for Marcos? I actually do really quick. Um, I'm on the website right now that Prof. Vero was sharing. There's um, the motto right there that says, within each of us, there's a seed of each of us, a sower. Am I saying that right? Did you come up with that model or, or who was it? Well, I mean, I contributed to it, but no, I mean, this is, this is, we're constantly rethinking, um, not so much in terms of models, but, but certainly in, in terms of clarifying our pedagogy, our philosophy, and even the way we teach teachers to be teachers. And, you know, it, in, in, the, over the summer, we spent time, um, thinking in now what how to redefine our pedagogy and our philosophy so that it wouldn't be something that's only coming from our perspective here as Chicanos but to be thinking a little bit more freely and broadly in our own language and in other indigenous languages about these ideas about education so it's it's a collective process and that's important because we root our what what we espouse as our philosophies 
and what we practice in our theories um, in education, we, we root it in the pueblos in Mexico as well that we work with. And so then we engage in an ongoing dialogue with teachers in Nahuatl pueblos in Mexico and, um, and continue that practice of, 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 um, of rethinking how we think about pedagogy. So no, I, I contributed to it, but this is something that's much bigger and broader than just me. It's beautiful though. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And that includes uh, Tomas and Maria, if you have a question or a comment, it's open to you as well. Uh, where did you study Nahuatl, just out of curiosity? At Semillas. <laughs> no, at, 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 uh, we, we fought for it at UCLA. Um, I mean, it is part of my family's language heritage, but we fought for those classes at UCLA. We have studied it on our own through our own Nahuatl teachers. Tata Kwashle Felix Evodio from Copalio Guerrero was one of our co-founders. And before that, you know, for many, many years, he was teaching community Nahuatl classes. And, and, um, and then now, now um, you know, our Nahuatl teachers are, are nationally influential in, in Nahuatl education. Uh, we're part of the, the Instituto Nacional de Lenguas Indígenas is creating a standardization of the Nahuatl alphabet uh, in Mexico. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Um, I know you have to run, Marcos, but thank you again so much for being with us. Um, and we'll be in touch. And I know that uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to send you all his email address in case any, anybody is interested in completing any of your agents of change um, activities, which your time is running out. Okay, we have this week and next week. Um, but if you want to reach out to him, he is trying to collect data and doing some work that you could possibly help with. So I'll send you all his mm -hmm. email. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Gracias. Thank you. Enjoy your class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next, um, I'm going to go just so that there's balance here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce Maria Larios uh, Horton. So let's see, Maria, I'm looking up your bio. Here you are. So, as a young child, Maria was brought to California from Mexico by her parents. As a teenage mother, became the first in her family to graduate college. She became an elementary school teacher and subsequently an education administrator. Now as ex executive director of diversity, equity and family engagement for the Santa Barbara Unified School District, Maria's team is focused on centering our most underserved students and their families through high quality interpretation and translation services. Culturally responsive family engagement and culturally and linguistically sustaining learning environments that promote the preservation of native languages. Maria lives in Santa Barbara and her husband Greg, with her husband Greg, and is the proud mother of Martin, a university graduate, and Isabel, a sophomore at UC Berkeley. Hermana, bienvenida. Thank you for being here with us. Gracias. Um, wow, the uh, previous um, presentation was very enlightening, and it makes me it almost makes me sad that um, all of our students can't have that kind of an experience um, to, to be a student at, at a school like Semillas, um, because that would, to me, that would seem like the gold standard for our children. Um, but until we can create a public school system that is, um, creates all schools in the, in the, in the, uh, way of, of a semillas school, we will we will continue to struggle um, to create environments of learning for students that are deserving um, of our students. So I really that was just a really great. Um, I I didn't know about semillas, so this was this was really amazing. And I am going to approach today's presentation, and I will need a timer because I also can go really really long. Um, so I'm approaching today, gracias, I'm approaching, okay, 15 minutos, I'm approaching today really from the lens of public school um, because that's, that's where I live. I live in, in public schools and um, my hope is to um, bring community together to be able to create schools that are deserving of, of our children. And I start with uh, Paulo Freire because um, it is a, it is, um, a text that um, it really drives my own philosophy of education. And in this particular 
case, I pulled um, this quote, language is never neutral. Um, so whatever we say, education is political. So whatever we say or what we call our students or what we decide to be uh, important um, really is about um, language and, lang and, and language is never neutral. So um, Veronica introduced me um, already and I just wanted to, I, I'm really excited to see so many young young students. Um, I, I hope you all are considering a career in education. I really do. I, I, I will hire you uh, in Santa Barbara if you, if you would like to come to Santa Barbara. We are looking for amazing bilingual, even if you're not bilingual, but just really good people to come and help us um, with our children. So um, I don't think I'll be able to see you all, but some of you probably learned English as an additional language. Um, so you can either just shake your head um, or thumbs up. How many of you learned English as an additional language? In other words, it was not your first language. Okay, many of you got it. And some of you, if not maybe most of you, given that maybe the age range here, probably attended schools where English was the primary language of instruction. Would that be correct? And maybe a few lucky of you did get to study in your first language um, or in Spanish. Um, and so that's great. And then sadly, I guess I could probably um, assume that some of you even lost some of that first language because of your schooling. Is that is that the case? Okay, I see some heads shaking. And again, I can't see everyone at the same time, but so that to, to me is something that is very, very tragic and it is very, very sad, but it is born of um, uh, what Maestro Marcos uh, mentioned earlier, which is this idea around um, white supremacy um, in our schools. And this idea that we must, um, have you leave your first language at the door when you walk into a classroom. And that that is the language that counts when in reality, that is really not the case and why we have so many issues um, with regard to a system that is not seeing our students um, in, 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 a, in a holistic way or in a whole way. We're, we're not able to, to do that. And so many of you may know this, a uh, quick little story. Um, I was a student at Cal State University Channel Islands in Camarillo even before it was CSUCI, the year before it became CSUCI. And I graduated from college in 1998 with the dream of becoming a maestra like, like Maestra um, Baladez, to becoming a bilingual teacher. Unfortunately, the year I graduated from your same institution was the year that Proposition 227 passed. And our district, Santa Barbara Unified, which is not too far from you, uh, became actually a district that banned bilingual education even before the state did. So infamously, Santa Barbara Unified made, um, made it to the New York Times because it was horrific. It was a horrific decision. Um, I was at that time working at Franklin Elementary School as an instructional assistant, going to board meetings, staying until 1 a.m. And like Maestra said, la lucha sigue. Like this, this lucha will never stop. We will never stop having to legitimize our language, our culture. It is a lucha that we have to be prepared for, not be afraid of, but just prepared for and know that it is, um, it will continue. So. In light of that, um, the state has made some progress, um, nothing too, too great, but 1998, now fast forward to around 2012, so a few, several years, 15 years of, of a school system that really was working really hard to strip our children of their first language and culture. And they did a really good job, sadly, very, very good job of doing that. So we're trying to reverse reverse um, reverse that in any way, shape we can. And so we know that at least half of the students, a little, a little fewer than half the students in California have a resource they bring with them to school and it is another language. And we see it as a problem when it really is a missed opportunity. It is um, something that we have um, 
neglected because of all the things that you've learned about in your class, racism, white supremacy, whatever you wanna call it, it is this idea that your language doesn't matter, your culture doesn't matter. And so because of that, you know, it is really important that as we as we move forward in education that we we remember um, wherever we go and wh whomever we talk to that um, language and culture are inextricable. So the moment that you ask me to set aside my language, you're asking me to set aside a part of me, uh, part of my identity. And this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, some local professors here um, in uh, at UCSB, which I think really speaks to the why. Why can't, why can we um, not afford to uh, have our children lose that first language? It's because it would definitely, it would hurt our students to ask them to, to leave aside that language. So, um, in our schools and how, how we educate students, there are two kinds of ways that we can educate a student, that we can um, bring students along in learning. A couple of, um, this is very basic, but one is uh, called a subtractive model and another is called an additive model. And subtractive models of education ask you to, again, leave your first language and to assimilate. Uh, what we want to see is more additive models. And that is something that we are still working hard to create because additive models ask us to help our students uh, continue their bilingualism and also make sure that our students are socioculturally competent and that they leave with a, um, a sense of critical consciousness and criticality of the same system that's actually educating them. So we actually want to develop students into, into um, thinkers that actually uh, test us, that actually question this, the very system um, that is teaching them. And so one really important tagline that really resonates with, with families in our community is this idea that you don't have to lose a language to learn a language, because that's precisely what we've been, we've been doing. We've been asking students to, um, to leave that behind. So, um, some of the work that we are seeing and that our district has, has adopted um, is this idea of through lines. And so when we go about making decisions for, um, for the children in our, in our schools, we have to make sure that we use these three core ideas of assets-based orientation, culturally and linguistically sustaining pedagogies, and linguistic and cultural hegemony. Um, or culturally and linguistic pluralism. Those are big, huge words to mean we have to do right by our students. We have to know our students. We have to spend our money in ways that support our students, that sustain their language and culture. And this last one is a big word, hegemony, but what it really means is that we have to drop this idea that everything white or white-centered is the norm. We have to be able to um, make decisions that allow us to teach other ways of knowing and being, um, and that um, if they don't have to look white. So these are just some of the big ideas that are coming out of not just our district, but in, in education in general. And we're hoping um, that our lucha continues, but at least now we have some anchors to be able to, to move forward with. And I'm going to share this presentation with Maestra and she can share it with you because all of these are hyperlinked to resources that we share with our teachers. So in this case, this resource is about our meta through lines. So when I, as a teacher, read these through lines, I'm going to make sure that when I design learning, whether that be curriculum, assessment, um, that I am using all of these three ideas in the design of my learning. And of course, this happens after our teachers have done a lot of internal work themselves because a little information could also harm our children. Um, so we, we are really um, wanting to do this in a very careful way. And we have been this past semester under pandemic, but um, these are just some of the ideas that we know our teachers need. And for many of you, this may be something that you already know, um, but in our district, 
For example, 70% of our teachers are white. Meanwhile, 70% of our students are students of color. So this doesn't come naturally to educators, right, um, who are white. So we have to do a lot of work here to be able to have classroom environments for Chicano, uh, Chicanx, Mexican, Mexican American, however, you know, we have to have ways of, of bridging those, um, those statistics, right? We have to do that. So um, this is just a couple of ideas around how we want to help orient our community, um, especially our teacher community. And it is that we really have to be able to think about our students in ways that are very different from what um, we've been taught all along, which is that anytime we see a child who isn't fluent in English uh, or who is not a uh, white American, that is, there is something wrong with them. There is something damaged. Um, and so we need to fix that. And it's quite, quite the opposite, right? The, um, we know that when we, we focus our attention on the assets or the, an abundance model, which is what is, it, what is it that our students bring into the classroom? And then we work from there that we are going to do less harm uh, uh, to our students. And so this is just one idea. This is another idea. Um, and then this next slide here. Um, also thinking about our community, oftentimes adults in our system, when they look at the, our, our families or our community, um, they all they see is problems. All they see is that, you know, our families can't do this or they can't do that. Um, as a personal example, you know, my mom didn't speak as, uh, English. So uh, uh, teachers normally looked at that as a problem because they couldn't communicate with her. When in reality, you know, my mother had so much to offer. Um, and so when we help our, the adults in the system see our families for what it is that they bring, um, the relationship uh, between community and schools will also change. Um, I hope I'm not, um, okay. So one example of how we're changing language is that some of you might know, in fact, some of you may have been um, identified as English learners when you were in school. I know I was. Um, but if you think about it, whoever created this label was not looking or thinking about our, the assets uh, that a student like me brings, brings to the classroom. So in our district, we have formally adopted a different term because this is where it starts, right? Language is everything. And so we, do, we no longer um, call students who are learning English as an additional language, English learners. We, do, we prefer to see them for what it is that they, um, that they are. They are. They are becoming multilingual. And my goodness, that is already um, a huge gain for our students. So that's just one example of how a system has been um, created uh, using a deficit orientation. And here we are trying really hard to change that orientation uh, for educators. So um, that was a huge win. All of our teachers now use um, this, this term and you might think, wow, it's just, a, it's just a word, but honestly, it really does make a difference. Um, I wanna share with you something really exciting for me um, and for our district. We may have been the first to, uh, to eliminate bilingual education. Uh, we're also kind of the last to implement something called dual language immersion. So dual language immersion, for those of you that may not know, is where we are, uh, we are able to teach in two languages. And in this case, oh, how many minutes? One, okay. So I won't share this video with you, but you'll be able to see it. Um, but tonight is our first informational session around, oops, I gotta fast forward this, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, but tonight is our first, um, our first parent information session for a new little school. So that's, that's very exciting. I wanted to just let you know that um, I, will sh I will leave this slide deck. I have some more resources, but these are some of the books that our teachers are reading to kind of help shift um, their thinking and so that we can create those learning environments that our students deserve. And then on this last slide, some resources for you as well, should you ever be interested in learning more about any of these ideas. So thank you, Veronica and, and students. 
Okay, thank you so much. That was very, very informational, like a lot of good information. Um, Jessica, you have a question. Go ahead and ask, unmute yourself. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Um, what did you say that it was called the dual, like the double language? Yes, dual language immersion is what it's called. And actually there are many programs in Ventura, many, many programs. In fact, I think my staff was a, te a bilingual teacher um, in a program like this. I, I don't remember, I don't recall yeah. if it was a dual immersion program, but yeah. um, yeah. yes, uh-huh, yep. So El Rio is one of, um, has several actually award-winning ones. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the really neat thing about dual language immersion programs is that through the study of language um, and your own language, you're also again building um, that criticality uh, around our school system. So it's not just about language, it's never just language. It's always a bridge to um, understanding our world differently. Um, so I encourage you again to become teachers. If you're bilingual, you could become a bilingual teacher um, and help our students um, keep that keep that language that um, we've been losing for so many years. Um, and I want to ask students, because I don't know if it's this class or another class, where some of you have shared that you were in a dual immersion program. So if you were, can use your little reaction uh, like this, a thumbs up. OK, there's uh, Malina, Arlene. Let me go to the other page, Daniela, Alyssa. Yeah, all right, so about four of you. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so I had the pleasure and honor of, of being a dual immersion teacher in Ventura at Montalvo Elementary. It was actually the first in the county to uh, launch a dual immersion program. Uh, and of course, at the time, everyone was saying, don't do it. Why are you going to do that? We're, we're done with bilingual education. Proposition 227 passed. Like, don't do it. Um, and so we didn't have a whole lot of support. And then we launched it anyway. And it was kind of like the pilot program of, of Ventura County. And then after some time, once we started to collect the data showing how well students were uh, learning both English speakers and Spanish speakers, right? Because you have to you know, have speakers from both languages so that they can learn from each other and model language for each other. Um, and they were both excelling all the way through high school. And my daughter, by the way, was in the program from kindergarten all the way through high school. So she's bilingual, biliterate, bicultural. Um, and so that that's a huge, that's a, that's a huge benefit for our students. So once we were, we were able to show the data, um, then everybody started jumping on it, right? And we had all these visitors come from everywhere to our school. And how are you doing this? How, how, how do you develop your program? What does it look from one grade to another and, and all that? So to see that it's grown so much from then to now is amazing. I absolutely love it. And I, I, I'm a huge advocate of dual immersion programs. And how that's different from the old school bilingual programs is that in the old school bilingual programs is that um, you would start off in English and Spanish or maybe mostly Spanish, whatever that may be, was different from school to school, district to dis district. But usually around third grade, they would trans transition you over to complete English only. Oh. And then you just lose your Spanish, right? Um, but in a dual immersion program, depending on what kind of program it is, um, the ideal, of course, would be to keep it through high school, then you, you're exposed to the language academic and whatnot from K to 12. And so that's, that's the best case scenario, right? But um, yeah, so, so Maria is like a pro in dual immersion and all, all this beautiful work that she's doing in Santa Barbara. Um, but other questions and comments, I see a lot going on in the chat, but we want to hear your voices. I just have a comment. Um, I have a four and three year old and they go to university preparation school in oh, Cambridge. I know you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they, um, I went there in, I'm 24 now, but I went there when I was in fourth grade. So for that school, you have to like start off in the preschool to like go through the whole dual language or kindergarten, yeah. but we still got the advantage to still take Spanish classes in like the fourth all the way up until the eighth grade so like I I'm not fluent in Spanish but I learned a lot and I understand it a lot more than I did before that but my kids it like makes me happy because I want them to be fluent I want them just to have that second language since in our like community and in, in um county like it's good to have that especially for like work and everything mm -hmm. so since they're so young they catch on to it easily and it makes me happy because they'll come home and they'll be singing in Spanish like talking and like they love to watch things in Spanish so just seeing them learn it and it was just like so easy for them to catch on it's like something I'm like 
most proud of that I'm doing this for them because I want them to be able to do that but I'm just excited because I can't wait to see like the next few years and see like you know like them become fluent in Spanish read it write it, and everything like that that's awesome our goal would be also to introduce indigenous language studies because Spanish is the language of colonizers right so that would be um, our next step for now. It's, you know, it's what it's dual language immersion. Spanish is the way to go, but we definitely need um, a lot of work around bringing um, those indigenous languages into, into our classrooms. So I'm excited for you and your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all have many more options than we did. That's for sure. So that's exciting. And you bring up a good point, Maria, because just like what we're saying, right, if we strip the Spanish language away from our Spanish speakers, then with that is the stripping of culture and identity, right? And, and that's very traumatic um, and it's very colonizing and it's very much rooted in white supremacy. So just think about how our native languages uh, were also stripped away from us and our ancestors and what that did to our identities, right? It's like, we don't, like we, we don't understand our indigeneity. We don't understand what our indigenous heritage is because we don't speak the language anymore. Uh, you know, and Marcos, while he was speaking in English, Spanish, Nahuatl, throwing in some Nahuatl words, like it's a lot to keep track of when we've lost that language, right? So, so think about that. And, and so the stripping of Spanish for your kids or even for yourselves has stripped that identity. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, making sure that we keep that language, but then also having to go back and relearn our native language, because in that language is, is locked all of these secrets, right, of the unknown of our identity. Because if you know how to um, break down the language and understand how it's put together, you're going to be able to, uh, to explain and understand things about our indigenous culture, rather than hearing it from the colonizers, right? because by the time they translate it from Nahuatl to Spanish and Spanish to English, so much is lost in, in translation, right? So that's why we're so like either uneducated or undereducated or miseducated about our indigenous history because we don't even have the power of our own native language to be able to unlock that, the accuracy of our history and our identities. So that's why language is incredibly important. And that's why, like Pablo Freire said, is not, it's never neutral, just mm -hmm. like education is never neutral. So other questions and comments for Maria. Hi, thanks so much for talking. I, <clears throat> I really, uh, this, this sounds like such a great and empowering idea, but um, I, I am English speaking, I'm monolinguic. Uh, in fact, I have a disability that I've tried learning Spanish and I can't. Um, so how, uh, as someone who is only English speaking, how can I help? Oh, I love, I love your question. <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, advocating, uh, being a good ally, anytime um, new proposals in our educational system are put forth to try and dis dismantle some of the white supremacy in our schools. Um, speaking up where decisions are being made um, is always the uh, one way that I could think of um, that you could help as a, as a, an, as a monolingual um, English speaking citizen. Um, and then wherever you are in other, any space is really to speak to the benefits of things like ethnic studies or um, you know, dual language immersion, you know, this idea that our students, uh, that English only practices have never worked. Um, and that uh, for some, they think, or they believe, or they have the opinion that if we just teach in English, then uh, our students are just going to be better off because English is, is the language of, you know, of business and trade and such. But really, all our research points to the opposite. So even though you are monolingual, you there are ways in which you can you can be a good a good ally uh, for the rest. Thanks so much. Most definitely. All right. So muchísimas gracias, Maria. You're so welcome to stay with us. But thank you so much okay. for being with us. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Tomas uh, in the interest of time here. So Tomas, muchísimas gracias again, hermano, for being with us. Uh, Tomas Hernandez is a native of Oxnard, California, and started drawing at age six by copying doodles he found in the margins of his mother's hair salon appointment book. He was diagnosed with dyslexia in fifth grade 
The ability to draw was crucial in his early development because reading, math, and writing were all arduous at the time. After military service and transferring from community college, he studied Chicanex art and mural creation at the University of California at Santa Barbara and graduated with a bachelor's degree shortly followed by co-creating Arts for Action that, that taught community muralism. An end result of his designing and painting multiple murals and installations in Ventura County was he discovered that Chicanex art could assist in visually revitalizing spaces to better reflect its surrounding communities. This realization led him to pursue a master's degree at California State University, Northridge, focusing on Chicanex art with a regenerative community focus. Welcome, hermano. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Gracias, hermana. Thank you for passing me the palabra. Um, it's good to see everybody's faces. Um, whew, congratulations, y'all made it. How's it feel to be like at the end of the semester? I mean, this Zoom stuff busted me, so I, I'm pretty sure that everybody else is a little busted, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you for those nods, that honesty, right? You know, being vulnerable to, to show that this ain't easy. You know, this ain't, this ain't for everybody. And um, that's like a really big thing, you know, like it should be for everybody, but it's not, you know, if we, if we talk about educational pipelines, you know, like right here's a super awesome book. If you're into books, um, Chicano Educational Pipeline, that really breaks it down about like how you, you all are like the 26, 27%, 30% maybe, 16% um, at the master's, 12 to 16% at the master's level, 2% at the PhD level, right? Um, so again, just through active learning by a show of thumbs, hands, claps, how many people are going to go on or vision going on to a master's from, from here, from today, from this point? All right. All right. PhDs. Did I see any more PhDs? A little harder to vision. Not so easy to think about. Money, loans, family. Where am I going to go? Right? All those are drawn in the pipeline all those are little drips in the pipeline about what we feel how how we consciously move forward in this educational system that we're talking about right um from you heard from my bio i'm not the best student by any means way shape form like nah i'm an artist but i'll become a badass student i mean like a badass student like a no touting my horn but like three nine ass student you know, so going from a dyslexic F in high school, like F, Ds, like back in my day, changing the F to a B with a typewriter so I could make my mom excited, you know, that I didn't get another F, you know, like to, to being in a master's program and killing it, it's taking dedication, right? And that's kind of like what I want to chat about today is that, is that dedication. Um, the word is um, resilience, right? Resilience. What is resilience? Can I get a, get a word from anybody? What resilience is? Don't stop. Non-stop, right? Okay. Anybody else? Not Maybe giving up. Okay. Uh, Tristan first, and then Alex, please. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm coming back after some hardship. All right. Perfect. Alex. Never giving up. Bouncing back. Yes. So that's the big thing, right? Um, so the metaphor I like to use is the palm tree. Which tree standing up after the hurricane? The palm tree, right? Because the palm tree isn't solid wood like that. It's made up of many fibers. And over the, the, the palm tree's life, those fibers break. Right, you're gonna break during this process and it's, it's, it's on purpose. Education tries to break you because they're trying to reduce the amount of people that are moving forward into the institution. So you gotta be that palm tree, right? When those, when the, when the, sorry, when the car crash comes, you gotta work through that, you know? Like, unfortunately for, for us that are, you know, have families and jobs, you know, you're gonna have to put those aside maybe and make time for your careers. So, in that resilience, I want to teach you something, okay? Because I'm kind of in between that like hardcore indigenous vato that I can be, um, and then the educated master student in a cohort, love my cohort, want to be that for you guys. Like I have volumes of books I can show you and quote stuff off of the top of my head, 
but I don't think that's education and I'm not looking to impress you in that way, right? So we're gonna give you real talk, knowledge, education. Like Profe was saying, here we go. I don't know if this is gonna work, but bear with me. How much time do I got, Profe? Time check. We have class until 5.45. So okay. in total, you have 15 minutes, but that includes okay. Q and A. Okay, we'll keep it short. Okay, so how many people, raise the little thumbs in your boxes, are situated on Chumash land right now? That means you're in Ventura County, Santa Barbara County, some parts of LA. Anybody from out of state currently? Nobody from out of state? Okay, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So first, land recognition, right? Want to give it up for the Chumash, for being stewards of the land, for millennium super down thank you you guys we're enjoying your beaches surfing skating buying our stuff living our california lifestyle because of their stewardship basic not too much no not argumentative we all know that's happened it's true okay so to the knowledge part okay what is this symbol right here if you can see it oh let me take off my background sorry just a sec uh uh preferences no background okay none all right so back to that what is this symbol who knows what that symbol is anybody i know you do my kids but <laughs> guesses let's get a guess come on guys Nothing. Take off. You're muted. Alex, you're muted. No, I was just gonna say I have no idea. I'm just trying One to think. I like the colors. Anybody? Does it look like a swastika to you? Yes. Time? Yes, right. Oh, now that you it's said like a swastika. It. Okay, so I was hoping somebody would say that, right? But we're gonna teach you right now what that really means. So I got these. So <clears throat> I'm going to teach you a song in Nahuatl really quick. Maybe Profe can give you a link to it later. And we're going to have that active education right here, right now, that active dialogue. We're going to give you the secrets of the universe in a couple of verses, OK? Remember that. Are they going to have to unmute themselves? No, no, I'll just okay. sing a short verse, and then we'll explain it afterwards. But okay. if you guys can learn it, maybe hum along, it's all good. Ready? Each li sot li ma li sot li sot ti ti li tonan sin. Each li sot li ma li sot li sot ti ti li tonan sin. Each li sot li ma li sot li sot ti ti li tonan sin. Each li sot li ma li sot li sot ti ti li tonan sin. All right. So that was the Ichli Sochli song. Tonight, go outside, find the Big Dipper, look for the Big Dipper in the sky. As the Big Dipper transverses the sky, this is the arm of the Big Dipper, it will move through the seasons and create this symbol. So if you go outside all year long and watch the Big Dipper, it will create this symbol, which is interpreted as the swastika, but it's not the swastika. It's the sign of the Big Dipper moving through the heavens during the year like this. The Big Dipper has an arm like this, and that's the arm pointing in different directions. So as Profe said, educationally, that song was brought to us from the Nahuatl people all the way to today to your classroom, held by the knowledge of danzantes, sun dancers, and ceremonial people so that you guys would get an astronomy lesson today a cultural astronomy lesson, right? So I ceremony and learned that song. I wouldn't know that unless somebody taught me the fossils, which are the steps to that song. Because there's a relationship, right? The danzante is like this. The danzante's feet are down here. Heaven's up here. So we are the flower that connects the earth and the sky like that. 
right? So knowledge just doesn't happen. I could write a whole dissertation just on that song, and Profe did. She wrote a whole thesis on songs and tattoos and meanings of things, right? Semonics, you know, the symbols, the meanings of symbols, typographies, you know, these are all badass words that you'll get as you go to the masters. So again, balancing that, that ness, right? Academicness with basically like ceremony and, and sacredness, right? How do we balance those two as, as educators? So that's my challenge to you. What is your road? Who is your innate person? How can you go forward as educators or whatever you're going to be and heal your communities, right? Because I don't know who your communities are. I don't know who your family is. I don't know how you were brought up. And I don't want to make any of those assumptions because they're subjective. So what I just showed you right now is universal knowledge. Nothing is going to stop that Big Dipper from spinning around like that. Not me teaching you that, not the world blowing up, none of that. That's going to continue to happen with or without us. So you now have a piece of generational, eternal knowledge, like fire in your hands. What are you going to do with it? I just gave you fire for the rest of your life knowledge. What are you going to do with it? That's the question. I hope that you all go and go on to PhDs in Chicano studies, but hey, that's just my hope. You know, that's what I'm going to do. So I say that out loud because that's my dream. You know, that's my vision for myself. But again, swinging back around resilience, right? How are you going to get that done? So I'm going to stop right here because I don't want to talk. I want to hear how you guys are going to get that done. So please, we'll either do this Freudian manner. I'll just sit here quiet for three minutes or and waste your time and mine, or somebody can just pop off and let me know how they feel. I'm going to mute myself. Hey, y'all, unmute. Let's hear your voices. What are you going to do with this fire? I'll break the ice. Um, I am going to take it and teach it to someone else. Um, Prof. Vero knows I work um, for a school and I work with little ones. And I think they'd be really interested in knowing this, especially because one of them is really into astronomy. So I think that's pretty neat. And I'm into astronomy, too. So I thought that was really, really nice. My little five-year-old just gave me this so that you guys know it means the the star the star flower in the sky. Sochi is is star, and the other word means flower. So, because Tomas and his wife Jessica are doing an excellent job homeschooling their children right now during COVID. <laughs> hi Emma and hi Coco. I know you're somewhere in the background. Hi girls, I miss you. <laughs> Aww. So you know, for for little ones like that to understand, you know what the miss you too from Sundance. The Sundance, that's right, girl. You got it going on. That's right. Uh, but for them to understand the stars and the flowers and the relationship between those two, um, you know, like Marcos was explaining at the beginning, like what is our learning experience and what is our way of being in relationship to the natural elements around us, right? We're so closed off uh, uh, from those those. Uh, interactions with nature, right? We're in this sterile building with walls and we're just, education is so dehumanized, right? But to humanize education means to understand the natural elements around us. Because like Tomas said, with or without us, those things are gonna exist. So we gotta learn them because we learn a lot from, from natural phenomenon. But all right, let's hear more stories. Uh, what are y'all gonna do with your fire? I can give it to you, but what you gonna do with it? Doesn't the Big Dipper, I mean, doesn't the Big Dipper point to the North Star? Yes, it does. It comes from the heart. I, just, I, I think when it goes like this, it moves and comes back around to it. But the, at one point, it is at the North Star. Um, just, look at, just look up uh, Big Dipper Celestial Movement, and it'll give you all the astronomical diagrams that you ever want to look at. And if you look at old Buddhist statues that are in Afghanistan, it's all the same symbols located on the neck of the Buddha, the earliest Buddha that's been carved out of stone in Afghanistan. So the star watchers were always doing that. There you go. So again, before all this technology, our, our knowledge was centered around what's going on in our universe, right?
I don't know, Profe, do you want to talk a little bit about the pasos and stuff or? Uh, for that particular danza? That's a little intense though, yeah. A That's little kind of, intense. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, back to the fire, what y'all gonna do? We start calling on people's names. Okay, that's cool. Um, let's see. Uh, Jessica Perez. Yes. What are you going to do with your fire? I will um, say it to my Nina because she believes in the signs a lot. And like, she's always like worshiping and like stuff like that. So I will probably be explaining this to her. <laughs> Sweet, I hope so. Uh, let's go to Rob. Let's see. Raymond? What is? Yeah, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I think I'd probably explain to my parents because uh, they're very into things like this. And I know that um, in like Chicano culture really goes into um, like my family. And I know they love to learn things that I know from this class. And that's a great example too, to teach them. Awesome, thank you. Guadalupe Morales. Guadalupe. Okay, Jackie Garcia. Um, with like my mom is really into things like that, and uh, she will. T she's from Oaxaca. So that's something that she is really interested in. So I'll mention it to her when I go and visit her. Awesome. So just reflecting back to, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of you are going to take the opportunity to share this information with your family. I also challenge you to ask them um, for what's called tech. Um, and it's called traditional ecological knowledge, tech, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, ask them to tell you a story about traditional ecological knowledge. You can also look that up. It's a very fancy academic word now. Um, but it's it's kind of like, how do we do things before everything was? And they have that knowledge and nobody asked them. You know, they probably hung their clothes outside. They probably dried their hair in the sun. Um, they probably did all kinds of different things to live, right? So how can we have a reciprocal relationship with those people and share knowledge from our school, but also get back knowledge from their old school knowledge that was shared to them by them with their grandparents, probably. If, if I may ask, what was the Big Dipper called before, um, before it was called the Big Dipper by the native people? I would have to defer to Profi on that one, but I think each Lisochli defines that it's, the, the flower star in the sky, because it turns like this. So each li is um, flower and then Sochi is star. I might have them backwards. Backwards. <laughs> yeah, backwards. Yeah. yeah. Dyslexia, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so yeah, that's how, that's how it'd be said. Um, and, then oh, it also, and it also represents the concept of uh, Naui Olin. Right now we being the, the number four and then Olin is that constant movement, right? And then um, how we understand that is that you can be still, but yet there's like this constant movement around you, right? So everything is still connected. And like, we're like so itty, bitty, 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 but we're still like connected to that, that force that is moving everything and everyone, right? So we we're far, but close and within at the same time. Anyone else? We have one more minute. I actually have a question. Um, Tomas, it seems like your your daughters have like um like a really big interest in, in what you were speaking about. How do you have these conversations with them? You know, since they're they're smaller, like how do you introduce these um these ideas and these topics to them? Um, we're basically ceremonial people. So since before they were born, uh, I've, I'm a sun dancer, so I've been sun dancing for 20 years. I pour sweat lodge in the prison for um, youth that are incarcerated. Um, I pour sweat lodge for veterans. Uh, I pour sweat lodge for the community. Uh, they've been to Sundance. They go to Danza. They've been to Bear Dance. They've been to Vision Quest. Um, so they're born and raised in it. Yeah, it's a part of their life. Yeah, it's a part of their life. Um, and so they're one, you know, like whatever they choose to do, they're going to do. But I'm going to definitely give them a good solid grounding. 
Um, and then they can just take that from there and run with it. I love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. So yeah, just to, to keep in mind that having a culturally relevant education starts at home, right? And the decolonizing process also st starts at home. Um, and, and never depend on the school system to be your, your, your semillas, your children's um, first teachers. You're the first teachers. You will always be the first teachers. So you need to teach them um, as much as you possibly can about their identity and where they come from and who they are because without that, we, we don't have anything, right? Without that, if we don't know where we came from, how are we gonna know where we're going? You know, We don't have roots, then we're gonna be knocked over by that first wind real quick real quick and we have been for hundreds of years right so it's it's about uh lifting ourselves up again making sure that our roots are developing and grounding us deep into the mother earth so that we don't fall again when that gust of wind comes right so that's what it's about and you know this culturally relevant education is every day and every minute of every day not just in the classroom right but what so like the way that Tomas and and his wife Jessica and his girls live their life it, like that's just the way of being it's not like, okay, it's class time, let's learn this. And then you go back to this very colonized way of being. It's this, we live this like day in and day out, right? And so you can choose to raise your children in that or, or not, but know that if you don't, then what you're doing is allowing for this very um, white supremacist and colonized way of living to consume your child and your child's spirit and identity as well. And so we, we cannot continue to allow that to happen, right? Whether it's the language and dual immersion programs and the culture that is infused within that um, and what we do also outside of our classrooms and education settings, right? And, and our communities and making sure that we're rooted in community and that we're building our community and that we're building our familias, right? Mm -hmm. And so, all right. Coco, do you wanna say anything? Wanna say anything? You sure? <laughs> okay, it's good to see you. Um, all right, y'all, so we are over our time. Muchisimas gracias again, Maria and Tomas. Thank you so much for, from the bottom of my heart for all the work that you all do in your communities, respective communities, our communities. Um, and we shall see each other again and continue to do this work porque la lucha sigue. Um, so if you all wanna go ahead and unmute yourselves to give your thank yous and goodbyes, please do so. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you Miss, I have a question. Um, the actives of change, when is that due? This week or the following week? I just want to make sure. I don't know off the top of my head, but whatever okay. whatever it says on Canvas, all the duties. It, does, it, does. it okay. says it's this Friday, the agents of change. Oh, it, okay, 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 okay. It pretty much says everything is due this Friday. Am I wrong, profe? I think that's right. I think yeah, that's okay. right. Forward, I'm looking at it. Yeah, because I also have to give myself enough time to look at all your assignments, grade all your assignments, input <laughs> years, so I need time. Um, but yeah, whatever you can do, and I'm also going to share with you, uh, Maria, if you have anything students can help you with, like something kind of quick and easy that's attainable for them, um, if you'd like, I can share your email with them, and Tomas as well, and Marcos, and y'all can just kind of reach out to these folks because they have like piles and piles and piles of work that is crazy for one human being to take care of, so if y'all can just you know, find a way to help a little bit even, then that, that would be helpful so that they can continue doing the great work that they're doing. Okay, so if that's okay, I will share your emails, yeah? All right, <laughs> it'll get one thing off your desk. <laughs> All right, y'all, so make sure I'll send you a message tonight as well, okay? All right, everybody. Thank Buenas you. noches, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Thank you. So you're gonna share um, Maria's um, email later on? Yes. Thank you.